You're tuned in to More Living with Jim Brogan, broadcast live from the Brogan Financial Studios at News Talk 98.7, where old-fashioned values, expert knowledge, and genuine understanding come together to give you the retirement straight talk you deserve. Jim's a former National Advisor of the Year recipient and a financial educator, and he's here today to talk about how you can live out the best years of your life. Jim and the Brogan Financial Team have been helping retirees and pre-retirees across the Southeast for over 20 years in their pursuit of financial independence. You can reach them during the week at 865-862-6800. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn, because more living with Jim Brogan starts now. Happy Saturday, East Tennessee, and welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI, and you know, since 1994, uh, we have celebrated the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, every January. Uh, his impact on the United States and the world as a peaceful advocate for civil rights is just as impactful today as it was when he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963. The study of our history is so important because it provides context. Many of our present cultural and political issues are not new, but rather are unresolved issues. Celebrating and understanding Dr. King is, gives us an opportunity to reflect. And then in February is Black History Month. So uh, we're going to talk about how far we've come and how, and, and, and how we can move forward in today's society. Our guest today is Reverend Renee Kessler. She is the president and CEO of the Bet Cultural Center here in Knoxville and has been working with the organization since 2014. She is an alumna of the University of Tennessee. She is a graduate of Leadership Knoxville and is a member of the Tennessee Chancellor Association program. She has been involved in numerous nonprofit, faith-based, and community boards throughout her career. So we're honored to have her on the show today to talk about Dr. King and to talk about the Bet Cultural Center. Renee, welcome to More Living. It's great to have you with us. Well, thank you so very much. I'm honored to be here. It's great. So uh, to talk a little bit about the goals and the vision for the Beck Cultural Center. Talk about your mission here in Knoxville. Thank you. Well, you know, Beck has been around since 1975. And Beck is really a result. Many people have heard a lot of conversation today, um, perhaps remembering the words urban renewal. So if you're familiar with urban renewal here in Knoxville, um, particularly as it relates to some of the development that's happening today, um, it's not unique to Knoxville. Urban renewal is a federal program that was happening throughout the country. And indeed, it was a part of the history of Knoxville. In Knoxville, urban renewal is going to go from 1959 to 1974. And many Blacks would term it urban removal because it literally almost wiped out the history of the black community and its location. Um, and that's how Beck was created. So the people uh, began to look at their community and how it had been uprooted. Again, the federal program was intended to remove blight and slum. And we like to say the wrecking ball went too far. Notwithstanding, as the community began to reflect on um, all of the upheaval they had just undergone, they began to talk about how if we don't begin to preserve and conserve this history, it's going to be almost as though it never existed. And so the people began to bring their artifacts, their history, and all of their memorabilia to a place, a home, uh, which was once occupied by James and Ethel Beck. And when, and so bringing all of those amazing artifacts and uh, memorabilia and um, antiquia that spoke to their history, they said, we need a place to preserve this. And so hence the Beck Cultural Exchange Center. Really, it was the people's project, and it was their way of preserving and conserving black history and culture in East Tennessee for generations to come. And here we are almost 50 years later, and we're still going. And interestingly enough, Beck is a repository as designated by the state of Tennessee for black history and culture and culture in East Tennessee. And absent of Beck, 
There's no single black history and culture museum in East Tennessee doing what we do. So we're very proud to be um, in the heart of Knox for our beloved community, sharing the history and continuing to tell the stories. Really, Jim, I'd like to say, unsilencing the voices of history. Now, you've been involved in numerous nonprofits uh, and faith-based and community boards, as I kind of mentioned there in the intro. Uh, what, what led you to becoming part of the leadership at the Beck Cultural Center? Well, I think I'm unique in that I am a native Knoxvillean, <laughs> born and raised in Knoxville. And so I'm very rooted in the history and in the culture. And um, to be quite honest, I love Knoxville. And so my life has always been rooted in community uh, and giving and supporting. Uh, and so it's natural then that I would find those organizations and groups and institutions who share that common goal of, I like to say, leaving uh, this world better than we found it. That's my goal in life. And certainly that's our goal at the Beck is really to leave it better than we found it. Um, and so I've always been intentional about the organizations that I've been a part of, those organizations that are intent intentionally doing great things to support our community and to make it better. Um, likewise, at the Bet, we are doing work that we hope is not only leaving our community better, but helping us to grow and be a better community. Our guest today is Reverend Renee Kessler. She's president and CEO of the Bet Cultural Exchange. And the bulk, the Bet Cultural Center, Renee, houses a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, what types of items can visitors see in the museum? Well, thank you. Um, we are very proud. Beck uh, boasts over 50,000 artifacts that speak to Black history and culture. Um, and particularly, a great deal of those artifacts speak to local and regional Black history and culture. And what makes us unique is that we do have an archival studio where we house uh, most of these antiquities. And, and to be totally honest, Beck has unique items, many of which you will only find in the Beck Culture Exchange Center. In other words, you can look all over the world. We have a large um, book collection, and many of our books are, are by authors that you can't find anywhere else really in the world except at Beck. For example, let me give you a good example of the kind of book for, that Beck hosts um, in our archives. Um, I don't know if you know, but here's some recent, some history for some of your listeners who may be interested in this, particularly um, as we talk about math and finances and uh, financial education. Math was a big deal in education. Um, and you may remember uh, a gentleman by the name of Kanzler. Um uh, Mr. Kanzler, uh, Warner, in fact, the whole Kanzler family, you might recall the Kanzler YMCA is named after the Kanzler family. But from the mother to the father to the sons, um, we actually have uh, a book that Charles Warner Kanzler wrote, a math book. He was an extraordinary mathematician. And he wrote a math book. He said he could, lightning calculations is what the book was called, and that's what he could do. That book really doesn't exist anywhere except in our collection. So we're proud to wow. have had that kind of book. Um, likewise, um, there are extraordinary people in our history that we have their artifacts that you won't find anywhere else. Artifacts on people like um, Dr. Henry Morgan Green, and that name may be familiar to you because Green Elementary School, which is located uh, in the heart of Knoxville, just on the other side of downtown Knoxville, on top of the hill, is named after Mr. Um, uh, Dr. Henry Morgan Green, which was an amazing doctor. Amazing in that he actually um, was uh, discovered the cure for a disease called pellagra. Beck has the book that he did on pellagra, which everyone from across the nation was reading to help with that skin disease that was affecting many communities. That book is in our collection as well. Um, and so that Green Elementary School is actually named in his honor and so many other great things that he, he has done. So maintaining that history and those artifacts that we have is an extraordinary thing and we're very proud to do that so again we have a temperature controlled archival studio where we house uh, most of our artifacts great collection of artwork um, books 
memorabilia history. And just, in fact, most recently, um, we had 49 boxes from one of our, the world's greatest poets, uh, who calls Knoxville home, Nikki Giovanni. Um, she shipped 49 boxes um, uh, here to Knoxville. Excuse me, she had a driver bring those here with her collection so that it could be preserved here at the Beck Culture Exchange Center. That's the kind of things that happen all over the country that takes in those kinds of archives. So it's a treasure trove, um, and it's the storehouse of Black history and culture. So for students, for researchers, it's an extraordinary place to come and do uh, research and to learn and to grow and, to, and, and for more books to be written. Um, but for tourists who come to our community and just those of us who live here, it's a great way to get to know about your community and the history of your community and the great people who come from this community. And we really like driving tourism because um, most of us know that when we go visit a place, um, we go visit a place that has a social attraction that we can connect to. And so often uh, it's said that tourists and, you know, we'll spend more money and stay longer in a community where there's actually a social benefit to it. And they're able to do some cultural activities and events that are interesting to them. So we like to think that the Bad Culture Exchange Center is helping to drive tourism because people want to hear and know this rich history. And I don't know when we will get to this, and I'm hoping that we will, because a lot of people are holding their breath and waiting for the world-renowned museum that we're going to be opening uh, very shortly. We've already uh, broke ground on it, and our contractors are beginning construction on the new Delaney Museum at Beck that will open. And so uh, in honor of Buford Delaney and his family. Yeah, and actually that is one of the things I want to get to in our next segment. Okay. And we're going to okay, talk about great. the different thing, you know, your continued focus on education and awareness throughout the community. So we're visiting with Reverend Renee Kessler at the Beck Cultural Center. Stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. I'm your host, Jim Brogan, and we're visiting this morning with Reverend Renee Kessler. She's with the Beck Cultural Center here in Knoxville. Uh, February, as we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, mm -hmm. uh, February is Black History Month. And uh, so we're kind of talking about uh, everything going on down at the Beck Cultural Center. You mentioned down uh, there, Renee, right before the break, uh, you mentioned about the... Uh, the Delaney Museum. T t tell us who was Buford Delaney <laughs> and what will be in this museum? Oh. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, Buford Delaney, I believe when we write the history books, we're going to say he was among the greatest artists ever. Now, many people call, today will say he is among the greatest artists of the abstract artists of the 20th century, but I do believe history will say that he is among the greatest artists that history has ever known. Um, not only because of his incredible work, but just his incredible legacy that he has left us to learn. Buford Delaney, born in 1901, uh, born right here in Knoxville, Tennessee, will go on to become this extraordinary artist who will move um, through um, uh, the, the Harlem Renaissance up in New York. He'll go through Chicago. He'll go to Boston. And then he'll make his way to um, Paris, France, where he will be interred. That, that's where he'll be his final living stop. But Knoxville is home. He'll be born to uh, John Samuel and Delia Delaney um, here in Knoxville. They will have 10 children. Only four of the 10 children will survive to adulthood, and the rest uh, will not make it. And much of that's going to be due to poverty, sickness, disease, malnutrition, things like that, that are really plagued a lot of very poor families. So we're talking about um, an extraordinary artist that came from very humble beginnings. Um, but his mother, who was a great matriarch, uh, really uh, encouraged and inspired not only Buford, but his younger brother, Joseph, who was born a three years uh, later, 
in 1904 um, to really use the gift that they have been given and start to work on drawing and art. And so as it turns out, Buford, um, Buford, uh, the, the, the father will uh, pass away in 1919. That's a very volatile year in history here in Knoxville because that's going to be um, the summer of the race riots here in Knoxville. And it's not just in Knoxville, but it, it will be across the country. In fact, we'll have more race riots during that period in our history. Uh, and it'll be so volatile with lynchings and so forth that they'll term it the red summer. And Knoxville will become one of the red summer cities. And that's significant because Buford often talked about that experience in his life because at that point, he is still living here in Knoxville and still studying and going to school and learning and living at the home. And so the elder brother, Samuel Delaney, uh, will come home in, in, in April of 1919 when the father passes away to help finish raising Buford and Joseph and also to support the mother. So he and his new bride uh, will come back home after having gotten their education and and work from the home. And they will work from the home at 815 East Vine Avenue. That's the original home place. And as I mentioned when we started the show, urban renewal will come in and demolish much of that community um, in, in, in East Knoxville, including the home, the original home of Buford and Joseph Delaney. Um, many times the house was dubbed as the business, and likewise it did that when Samuel came back home. Like his father, John Samuel, he would become a barber. So many people in Knoxville will remember um, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Samuel Delaney, their barber. Uh, and he did uh, the, he had the barber shop at the home. Uh, and then eventually he will purchase the house at 1935 Dandridge Avenue, and the barber shop will become the full shop there in the home. He'll move Delia, the mother, uh, to the larger home after Buford and Joseph will go off to pursue their art career. So now, whenever Buford would come back home to visit, um, the home would be at 1935 Dandridge because Urban Renewal will, of course, take the only remaining ancestral home they have. So there's only two homes in Knoxville that they would have ever known, uh, both the 815, which no longer stands. But we do have markers there, historical markers, uh, at that location on Summit Hill to denote where that would have been. And then we also have the final home place, which is right next door to the Beck Culture Exchange Center. So you have the Beck Culture Exchange Center at 1927 Dandridge Avenue, and we actually share a driveway. And so Beck also owns the home, the final home place of Buford, uh, the ancestral home of the Delaney family, of which would have been Delaney Buford's home at 1935. And so we're restoring that as a permanent monument to the Delaney family. And on the second floor is a complete um, uh, second floor dedication to Buford Delaney uh, and his artwork and his uh, history and his legacy that he has left us to continue to study, as well as an artist in residence studio apartment on the second floor. So we'll be bringing BIPOC artists from all over the country um, to come in and to share and to study this. And Beck has been partnering with several great folks like the Knoxville Museum of Art uh, and the University of Tennessee Libraries, who just recently um, made a large purchase. And we're just working together on the art, on the exhibits, on the history, so that when we open this museum, the world will come here to view uh, the only remaining ancestral home dedicated to the Delaney family and viewed for Delaney. And particularly, we have partners in Paris, France, which is um, the Friends of Buford Delaney uh, under Monique uh, Wells, a, a, um, who started the foundation in Paris, France. And right now, we're in partnership with all of these people because we believe it's those partnerships that really help us tell the whole story of this extraordinary artist that people are still talking about to this day. And you may have heard um, at the new baseball stadium that is being developed, the very first residential building will be named after Buford Delaney. So it will be Buford Delaney residence. And so we're excited about that too. So just trying to get the world to know that yes, Buford Delaney was an extraordinary artist and we're still studying him today. But perhaps what makes him so extraordinary is that he came from a little place called Knoxville, Tennessee. That's right. What What is the timeline <laughs> for the, the Delaney Museum at Beck? 
you know, we, as I said, we broke ground on it in August of 2021. And so we would love to say that by the end of 2023, um, we're opening our doors as we rise into 24 on the new Delaney Museum. We're visiting with so Reverend we'll begin Renee. Construction. Yes, ma'am. We're visiting with Reverend Renee Kessler of the Beck Cultural Center. Um, you know, I know the vision of Beck is to be the desired place that people go to learn, discover, and experience mm -hmm. the rich legacy of African Americans inside a vibrant cultural quarter. And, the mm. Beck, you know, I know the, with this large focus on education and awareness throughout the mm -hmm. community, tell us about some of the educational programs you work on. Thank you. Beck does programs throughout the year, and we're very proud of all of the programs that we do to really expose our community to activities um, and events that help speak to the history and meet us in different genres in order to do that. So throughout the year, Beck does uh, Black History and Culture programs. But one of the things that we're most proud of, Jim, is that we like to say we're celebrating right now Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, and this is phenomenal, and we love to do that. In February, we're going to celebrate 28 days of black history and culture. We think that's phenomenal. But Beck does black history and culture 365. That means for 365 days a year, um, we tell you black history and culture facts and history and narratives that you can learn about every single day, many of which happened right here in our community, many of which are attributed to extraordinary people right here from our community. So on Beck, we have the Beck e-newsletter every single Friday, and we've been doing this, this will be our third year doing this. Um, every single Friday, we have a Black history, uh, we have a Beck um, e-newsletter that comes out. So if you go to beckcenter.net, um, you can sign up for the Beck e-newsletter. On Fridays, the newsletter will have a week of Black History facts. So literally for every day in that week, you get a fact about something that happened in history on that day. And then on the last Friday of the month, every month, in addition to that week of Black History Facts, you'll also get a story. A, we write an original narrative on something great that has happened in our history or just understanding our community better and some of the great folks that have lived in our community. So we write a Black History narrative um, on the last Friday in addition to those Black History Facts. So if you get that newsletter every Friday, at the end of the year, you'd have gotten 365 days of Black History and Culture facts so that you're educated on all things and you can say, I know this history. <laughs> We're visiting with Reverend Renee Kessler. When we come back, we want to talk a little bit more about the impact of Martin Luther King Jr. and his nonviolent approach and all of the things that he was able to develop. But then also, you know, what, where do we need to be headed forward in the future? So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back. This is More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. You can catch us every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m., and again, from 3 to 4 p.m. All of our shows are also podcast on our website. If you go to broganfinancial.com, click on radio. You can also go to uh, YouTube and type in More Living and listen to our podcasts. We're visiting this morning with Re Reverend Renee Kessler. She is with the Bet Cultural Center on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend as we will mm -hmm. be celebrating his birthday uh, Monday. And... Renee, Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent approach to achieving equal rights for black Americans earned him the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. King is renowned for his masterful or, 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 oration skills, I guess you could say, most memorably in his I Have a Dream speech. Can you discuss with us uh, Dr. King's impact uh, on where we are now and even maybe where we may be headed? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
You know, I think the first thing I have to say about Dr. King is that we have to be very careful about how we remember him. Because I would imagine that as extraordinary as he was, it was never about him. And I don't think he would want us to just remember Martin King, the man, but rather the mission. Because indeed, he was the face of the movement. Indeed, he was the voice of the movement. And indeed, he had the heart of the movement. But I also believe there were many people, many, and what he did was extraordinary because of the force that he had surrounding him and with him and beside him and behind him. And so I think it's very important that as we remember Dr. King, that we remember the legacy of Dr. King and the movement and the people who were in it, because I think that's how we honor him. And I think that's what he would want, that it wasn't about him, the man, but it was about the mission. And I also believe that, um, that he, it wasn't an accident or a coincidence that, and I, and I like, I, I say this because I remember C.T. Vivian saying this uh, when I first met him. He said, Reverend, he said, it's not an accident or a coincidence that all of the leaders of the movement, uh, the civil rights movement, were ministers of the gospel. He said, because we understood it was a spiritual warfare that we were fighting. And I think that when you think about the movement and many of the greats in the movement, they were ministers of the gospel. So when you talk about uh, Dr. King winning the Nobel Peace Prize, what you're really talking about is a man who also had the heart of God. And in that comes peace. In that comes love. In that comes compassion. And so we fight differently. Uh, when we are believers, we fight differently when we are children of God. It's a strong fight. Um, it is nothing weak about it, but it is also, it is always a fight that honors God. And so I think that's what we remember, and that's why it's so important the way the nonviolent movement moved. Um, it was moving in sync with uh, and in harmony with the belief system um, on their principles in which they stood. Likewise, Today, I see there are many uh, ministers of the Gospels who are still carrying that torch, or people who have strong faith, whatever their faith might be, um, that's leading them. And I think that's that charge for nonviolent and peaceful resolution. Um, and it also, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that's remarkably well said. What, what do you think Dr. King would say about where we are today? I think in so many ways, um, just like many of us today, we look at history and say, wow, we have really come a long way. Um, and then you look at where you are and where you want to get to and where we need to be, and you may just sit back and say, wow, we have a really long ways to go. So I think that it's a positive I think you can't help but say positive and point to some amazing positive milestones uh, that we have made today versus uh, Dr. King's time in the civil rights movement yesterday. But then I think you think about some things. Have we gone back in some areas? Is there some things we could do better? And, and there are some things that we still haven't begun to address. So I think what I want to say and what I think he would say is the work continues, the fight continues. So I think that we have to keep getting better until we can unpack all of the layers um, that systemic uh, issues have been embedded within our history that we've not un unpacked uh, to its fullest. Renee, do you have a favorite Dr. King quote? Gosh, I do. Um, there's so, uh, as the preacher of the gospel, I have uh, preached I've preached his sermons. <laughs> um, so many of my favorite ones. Um, uh, I, I want to say a quote, but I have to tell you this. I like when he said, if it falls your lot in life to be a street sweeper. And then he goes on to say, you know, Sweet streets like Beethoven composed music, right? Uh -huh. Sweet streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweet streets like um, Nikki, you know, he just goes on to all these greats and he says this, sweep streets so well that when you die, 
all the heaven and hosts will have to pause and say, here lied a great street sweeper who swept his job well. So whatever it falls your lot in life to be, do it so well that the living, the dead, nor the unborn could do it better. And so that's what inspires me is to be my best. Whatever my lot is, each of us have a call on our life. Each of us have something that we can do to make this world better, to, to, do, to do something bigger than self. Whatever that is, you have to do that and do it so well that no one could do it better. And that's what we want to inspire the younger generation to do and to be and to keep being. And the thing I love when I talk about preaching his funeral, I say, I, if, you are, if you happen to be around when I leave this world, and then, and then he goes on to talk about, um, don't say of Martin, if you happen to be there on that day, that Martin won the Nobel Peace Prize, right? That Martin won all of these awards, that, that, that Martin had all of these degrees. He said, if you happen to be around, you don't have to preach a long sermon. You don't have to say a lot. You don't have to give that bio. He said, but I hope that on that day, someone can say of Martin, I did visit the sick, that I did visit those who were in prison, that I did feed the hungry, that I did provide clothing to those who did not have clothing, that I did my best to serve. And that's what we all have to do. What are you doing yeah, to that's serve, our bib- to do that's something our bigger than the others? Absolutely, our biblical calling for all of us. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I'm going to shift. It is service. Yes, absolutely. Um Black History Month is celebrated in February, so just around the corner. Um, (laughs) You know, it coincided with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two men who fought for the freedom of slaves. Um, What kind of events do we have locally, Renee, as part of the education and celebration of black history? Well, one of the things I want to always say is to Black History and Culture and the Beck Center and Martin Luther King birthday in January and Black History Month in February is not for black people. <laughs> I want to make that perfectly clear. Beck, Black History and Culture, Martin Luther King holiday and celebration and event and Black History Month is for all people. It's for all of us. And I promise you, you will find yourself in the story. It's a beautiful story that we're all entangled in and that it's beautiful because we all get to learn from it, no matter who you are. And so obviously right now, uh, your show is airing today. So we still have some events coming up with Martin Luther King Day. So we're excited about um, the events that are still here that people can do the Night of the Arts with the Dr. Martin Luther King Commemorative Commission on Sunday. Um, The Knoxville Symphony Orchestra Orchestra is doing a celebration concert at the Tennessee Theater, which is free on Sunday the 15th at 3 o'clock. That evening, the Dr. Martin Luther King Commemorative Commission is doing a program at the University of Tennessee. Um, And then um, at 6 p.m., it's the Night of the Arts tribute that they will be doing. And then again on Monday, we'll have the big Memorial Day celebration, um, which is at 12 o'clock noon. And that's going to be at the Overcoming Believers Church. So there's still a lot to get involved in and to enjoy um, during the month of January. In February, Beck always does an eclectic mix of different activities and events that you can stay tuned for, you can visit, you can learn, you can grow, you can come and um, do tours. But the big event that I really want to highlight is always, and just keep your calendars marked, because all of our events that we do each year, we try to set the same date and time so you can be looking for it. So we always have a Black History and Culture program on the last Friday of, excuse me, the last Monday, pardon me, the last Monday of February, which is February the 27th, and it's generally at the Bijou Theater. We do a big Black History and Cultural event where the entire community can come out for a celebration of um, all kinds of dance and entertainment and music and just fellowship, and it's wonderful. And this year, uh, we're titling it The Dream. And we will bring back Dr. King from January and bring him into February. And we're going to talk about the dream. And we're going to talk about um, all of the wonderful things we continue to dream about. So everyone is invited to that. Renee, how can people get more information? I guess Mm BeckCenter.net. How can people find out more, get involved with the Beck Cultural Center, and even support Mm -hmm. the Beck Cultural Center? Thank you so much, Jim. Um, 
please sign up for the Beck e-newsletter at beckcenter.net because that's the first way that you can get connected. Because what it does is every Friday when it sends out a Beck e-newsletter, it will give you all kinds of information about events that are happening, things that are coming up, in addition to all that education that I mentioned earlier in the show, that it gives you black history and culture facts 365 days a year. So it's once a week. And sometimes we'll do it more if there are events coming up to remind you uh, of the events that's coming up. And the other great thing is that we don't just post all of the events that are happening at the Beck, but anything that's happening in our community that has a black history and culture flavor or feel that you might be interested in learning about or going to or, you know, just being a part of, that will also be in the Beck e-newsletter. And then let me invite you to come by and do a tour. If you have a group, your students, uh, we do, right now we don't have an age group for elementary students. We're working on programming for that. So Beck is not really geared um, right now for elementary students, but we're working with students at the University of Tennessee to devise a program for that. From, from middle school to high school to collegiate and to adult, church groups. If you have groups, call us, get on a calendar and schedule you a group tour with your group. We have a 21 minute film that we show um, that gives you the history in a film format so you can hear the stories, hear the voices, see the pictures, and then you can also tour the back. And then you can get involved even more. Um, you can volunteer for some of the events and activities. You can work in our archival studio. If you like grounds, we've got a large grounds campus, so we love people who want to come by, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, groups who like flowers or who want to plant and help with shrubberies. And if you're interested in the Delaney Project, you know, we need support for the Delaney Project. Help us get the word out. Help us to promote Delaney. Help us to share the history of Delaney. Help bring your memories, any memories that you have. And remember, when we talk about memories, this is very important. Oral histories are critical. So if there is someone listening, and I don't care what your nationality is, what your race is, if you're listening and your history is tied is tied to Knoxville history, your family, your culture. We want to hear from you. Help us tell the story. I tell people this all the time. If I talk about black history and culture and I don't mention anything about white people, then I didn't tell the whole story. Likewise, in history, if all we're telling is one part of the story of white people, we're not talking about things that black people did other than being enslaved, then we didn't tell the whole story. Beck is committed to telling the entire story. So help us make sure that we're doing that, that we're telling the whole story. Like, let me say this to you. We talk about education. We talk about Austin High School. Today it's called Austin East High School. It is the oldest black school uh, for black children in East Tennessee. In fact, um, the school is going to open in 1879. Here's the history I want you to know about the school because many people don't know this. The school was originally called Austin High School. Later, it'll become Austin East as it merges the all-black school Austin with the all-white school East to make Austin East. But what you may or may not know is the person who opened that first school for quote-unquote colored children, which is what it's going to be called um, in, in, in the early 18, 19th century, you're going to be, um, it's going to be named after a woman by the name of Emily Austin, a white woman who came from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1879, began to educate black children. And then when she realized there was no high school for black children in Knoxville, raised the money, came back to Knoxville and opened the first school for black children in East Tennessee, Austin High School, named after a white woman, Emily Austin. So history must be told, but the full story of history with all people included. Well, Renee, your, uh, your energy and enthusiasm is really something and very contagious. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. time to be with us this morning. This is Renee, Reverend Renee Kessler. Uh, she is the <laughs> president and CEO of the Bet Cultural Exchange. So much. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule this weekend. What an honor, and thank you for what you do. Absolutely. That's again, that's uh, Reverend Renee Kessler as we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day this weekend and really the whole weekend and also Black History Month in February. When we come back, we'll have our dollars and cents segment. We're going to talk about covering the rising health care costs in retirement. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. 
Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. Welcome back to More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Again, want to thank uh, Reverend Renee Kessler of the Beck Cultural Center. You can go to beckcenter.net to find out more information. Uh, it is time for Dollars and Cents. Want to be sure you are getting the most out of your retirement? For all the years of your retirement? That's the primary goal of More Living with Jim Brogan and our Dollars and Cents segment, where we provide you with an important financial tip that will help positively impact the quality of your life in retirement. And now, here's Jim with this week's Dollars and Cents tip. One of the highest expenditures in retirement is health care. So finding ways to optimize your spending on health care can help protect your retirement finances for the long run. Uh, believe it or not, in 1960, health care spending as a percentage of U.S. GDP was 5%. Uh, it is now, at least in 2020, spending hit almost 20% of U.S. GDP. So as a percentage of our economy, uh, it almost quadrupled in the last 50, well, I guess 60 years. Um, you know, health care, now, now one of the things you want to remember is, you know, when we, the, the average retiree at age 65 is going to spend close to 350000 uh, on their health care expenses over the rest of their lifetime. Now, that includes that includes their Medicare premiums and things like that. It does not include their lo- any long-term care costs. Um, it, but, but the reality is you don't have to write a check for that on, at age 65. It, it is planned into your uh, monthly and annual budget. Uh, but it's a very important spending category, so you really should be building this into your income plan and then be sure that you're aware of the long-term care potential. You know, seven out of 10 people age 65 are gonna need long-term health care, which means you can't live completely independently and need help. So fitting this into your income plan is critically important as you approach retirement and then as you live through what should be the best years of your life. Thank you for tuning in this week. Uh, next week, we're going to have Dr. Harold Black from UT's Department of Finance, for former department head, and we're going to talk about the economy and the outlook for 2023. So, so thank you for being with us. Thank you to Chris for engineering the show. Thank you to Jill for producing the show. You're listening to More Living with Jim Brogan, only on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. The views expressed by Jim Brogan and his guests are not that of Cumulus Media. Any discussion of financial, legal, and tax planning strategies is not intended to be individualized advice and is general in nature. Always consult with your advisor for advice specific to your needs. This program's content does not represent a recommendation of any particular security, strategy, or investment by Jim Brogan or Brogan Financial Incorporated.